So there's a, there's something else that I wanted to talk to you about, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the importance of the groove when you play your instrument. What and how did that develop for you over time to where uh, not only your groove, but you, your musical ideas are vast. All you've always like any musical situation we've been in, you've always been able to bring tons of information, you know, to the session that we were in or, you know, or if we we're playing live or whatever, there's always like great musicality, great musicality in there. And, but also a deep, deep groove, you know, to where it was always a joy to play with you. What do you think made you a better groove player or how did that happen for you? I, I think I had the, the best uh, groove teacher in the world when I was a teenager and that was John Bonham. Nice. I just, you know, I remember I wanted to be a drummer originally. It's a good thing I'm, I'm not because, you know, we have Joe Travers, <laughs> right? And of course, Marco Miniman and Kenny Aronoff and all these great drummers that I've, you know, been fortunate enough to play with, Absolutely. you know, over the years. Uh, but I remember being a kid and hearing Led Zeppelin and just being like, I realizing that the drums were just so groovy that that groove was so wide that it, it, there was such a vibe. I mean, like, you know, we don't have to talk about how great Deep. John Bonham is. Everybody yes. knows, right? And so I thought to myself, I want to be able to do that. And so I asked, I remember I asked my parents, I think I maybe was 12. And, and I said, Mom, Dad, I, I want to play drums. Can I have a drum kit? And you know when you're a kid, when your parents say no and... You can tell that like maybe there's like some room and you're like, oh, you know, I can, we can talk about this. We can negotiate it. That wasn't the no that I got. I got the other no. The oh. no that was like, this is not going to happen today and it's never going to happen oh. ever. Like they were just like, no. And I was like, okay. So, uh, and what I did was instead was I, I would sit in my room and imagine that I had a drum kit. And like, for example, I would play Kashmir, which is like this, this most simple groove, right? All it is is just like, oh, hi, Ellie. Hi, where's your good girl? Are you, do you want a groove Everybody too? Everybody say hi to Ellie. Everybody say hi, Ellie. Hi, good girl. <laughs> hi, good girl. Oh, look at this good girl. So yeah, it was just, got, 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 and, and, and then I, I started kind of doing that with other Led Zeppelin songs, simple ones, ones that I could see in my head, like rock and roll, you know, you know, do, got, do, got, do, got, do, just really simple stuff. So eventually when I actually got went over to a friend's place and could sit down in a drum kit, I could do these things, but I could only conceptualize them. My limbs couldn't behave the way that I was hearing this deep, fat groove that John Bonham was playing. Or that any drummer was playing, really. Uh, and so what I realized was I was already playing keyboards and I was playing bass. And, and both of those instruments, I felt like I had a really good command of what my brain was hearing in terms of a groove and being able to translate it to things that I could actually execute. So when I was a teenager, I used to practice, I just used to learn songs by ear on piano and I would just play them on piano. I'd play the bass and the drum part a little bit with the left hand. And, Play the rest of it with the right hand and i always felt like i always felt confident that what i was doing was in a groove and then when i was playing bass i would play along with a lot of led zeppelin records and that's i just felt like man this feels great and of course you're in high school right and i wanted to play with a live drummer and the drummers in high school you know were just they weren't john bonham right i mean even <laughs> professional drummers weren't john bonham these high school drummers oh he's a good girl these uh the, the uh uh, the high school drummers were definitely not John Bonham. So I just remember thinking to myself, man, I just want to play with a drummer who can do that thing that I'm hearing on the record because that's a deep groove and my hand feels like I can do it. But I couldn't really do it because I couldn't do it with anything but a record until, again, I got to Berkeley and then I met Joe Travers. And then I was just like, that guy sounds like John Bonham. That's the groove that uh, that I'm looking for. And uh, from that point forward, it was like, yes, I... I can hear and feel a groove that I can play live on a bass guitar and I can play it with a, another guy who gets it. And that's when I realized that a groove is not a solo concept. It's really a group thing. Everybody's got to have their own strong groove when you come in, but just you by yourself, it doesn't really mean anything. Unless you're just going to be a bedroom player and play along the records, right? You got to be able to do it with other people.
Everybody's got their own little different feels. Where they are slightly behind on top in the set, whatever. Uh, but as long as you know where your groove is, and you got playing with other, you know, kind of professional level players who have a really good sense of time, and they have a good sense of where their groove is, you know, now we're talking. You know, then you can really make some some grooving happening. But it really does go back to to me wanting to be John Bonham. Uh, eventually I got to, you know, I, I ended up working at a bass amp company and they had a drum kit in the sound room and I used to go down there and I used to play Rage Against the Machine songs on the drums. Nice. My favorite things to do. I would play Testify and, uh, you know, Bulls on Parade and, uh, and stuff like that because those drum grooves are really simple to execute. Yeah. Uh, and I could almost make them groove, you know, and I got to live out my little fantasy of, of being a, a drummer who could feel and sound like that. Well, had you had the time to like, you know, really practice on drums and do it, you, you could get there. I don't know, you know. It's, it's in you, it's yeah. in you. It, I think it's definitely yeah. in you. You know, yeah. you can tell when when you, when I hear you play. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, Even the, by yourself. The good news is uh, I don't have to worry about that, you know, because uh, there are great drummers. There's that great I get drummers. To, now there's great drummers I get to play with. You but know? okay, but even when you're playing with great drummers, the groove is at that point there's a band and that groove yeah. is a collective of everybody yeah. you know, everybody's feeling everybody at that's that right point. that's right right so uh, that yeah was, led zeppelin right you know yeah. you've got uh, jimmy page and john paul jones and john bonham that's a great band but yeah. also you know and that's another reason why I, uh, I would say of all the progressive bands that i that i that i listen to i always gravitated towards yes because Chris Squire is such a greasy ass groove, has that nasty pick sound and that real the way that he dug in. You know, it, it Genesis is a great band, but they didn't have that that right. really fat greasy groove. And some of the other prog bands, I felt like you know didn't necessarily have that either. King Crimson, yeah, John Witten had that kind of thick bass sound, and Bruford was in that band too. Bill Bruford on drums, so not a coincidence there. But Chris Squire really you know brought some rootsy R and B kind of vibe to their kind of classical counterpoint compositional thing. And so between those two guys, really, that's probably where it all came from for me. Yeah. That's cool. Zeppelin was a big thing for me too when I was a kid. Yeah. As far as groove. How could it not be? In, in the rock idiom, you know. But then there was like the funk idiom too, or the funk styles where yeah. an R&B, you know, James Jamerson. Right, right. Of course. Which I was going to ask you about, because yeah. when we played R&B together, yeah. your James Jamerson type of playing or style is really beautiful. Well, I and appreciate that. But, you know, of course, it, it's all James Jamerson filtered through John Paul Jones in a way. Okay. And that's what John Paul Jones was doing, really. He was, yeah. he was of that era, and he played a lot of session music and soul music at the time. And so he was kind of informed by that in a contemporary way, which is really cool. Eventually, I did go back and get back to the original source material and play, you know, learn the Jameson lines, James, okay. you know, and, and do that stuff. But, you know. Did you do that at Berkeley? Or I did it at Berkeley, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I transcribed a few of the original, you know, the original what's going on, you know, the yeah. classic thing, all the rest. But, you know, more of it came from, like, playing the Lemon song, which is just John Paul Jones being James Jamerson, really, yeah. in a way, over a blues. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, like, you know, and all that Motown stuff. And of course, there's the, the James Brown stuff and, you know, old Bootsy and Clyde Stubblefield. That stuff's all great. But if you just think about, like, how laid back and groovy a, a riff like Led Zeppelin's The Ocean is. Oh, I, I mean, they're laying back so hard, but, like, it never drags. It's always driving. Yeah. You know, they, you know, rock bands. Just not every rock band had that going for them of that time because they just didn't have John Bonham. Yeah. That's why it was so great. Yeah. Even though, obviously, he was a troubled guy. That was one of my favorite uh, Zeppelin records. For yeah, sure. House is the Holy, man. My God. Yeah. You know? I mean, just listen to how deep the groove in No Quarter is. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's all just swinging yeah. so hard, even though it's not a swing groove, you know, technically. Yeah. It's all somehow bouncing and swinging. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely John Bonham, you could hear it in his playing right away. You yeah. Know, but there was a lot of 
um, other rock drummers that, you know, like even on the Deep Purple side, for example, Ian Pace. Yeah. Uh-huh. He was a very groovy drummer, man. Uh-huh. Dude, he, people don't give him enough credit for, yeah, yeah, for yeah. that, you know? Yeah, yeah, I can buy so, that. Even uh, Geezer Butler. Yeah. He had a, you know. Definitely. All that, you know, uh, what, I can't remember the name of the song now. The uh, ba, ba, uh, 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 I mean, he's bouncing, man. It's yeah. cool. Well, that's great. Well, you definitely uh, developed your own style within all yeah. that, too. And you bring so much cool musicality to any project that uh, Thank you. that I've heard you play in. Well, so do you. Oh. Groovy Rick Massal. That's why you're Groovy RM. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind. Thank you. But, uh, well, cool. So, uh, what are you excited about musically now, and what's coming up for you? Well, uh, right now, I uh, am deep, deep in post-production for the Aristocrats' first new studio album in five years, which will be coming out uh, early next year. It's nine songs, as always. We all, we all me and Guthrie Govan on guitar and Marco Miniman on drums, we're all composers and, and producers of our own stuff. So, we each have three songs, as always, but we're taking more time than ever Usually our productions are pretty fast and raw, uh, uh, which some of it is a function of the fact that Guthrie lives in London and we're here, and, but there's always usually so much going on. But this one, we just have taken more time with it. And I, you know, it's such a cliche to be like, oh, it's our best work yet, but like, I know it is, and I cannot wait to share it with everybody. Uh, so there's a lot going on around that right now. And uh, we're still finishing up our, our, our world tour, kind of the coming out of COVID era, the Defrost tour. Uh, and so I'm going to be going to Europe with the aristocrats later this year. It's right now as the time of this taping, it's August, uh, 2023. Uh, and, uh, that tour is going to be October, November, and early December of 2023. But before that, uh, I'm going on the road with death clock, which is, uh, based around that, uh, the cartoon metalocalypse, which aired on adult swim, uh, for a few years in the late aughts and early teens and, uh, is now making a comeback. There's a new movie, there's a new album, and there's going to be a tour co-headlining with Baby Metal, which is really exciting. Uh, and so that's happening really soon. That's like rehearsals starting like four days, uh, and then that tour is going to be all of September. And uh, and uh, so I've been doing a lot of, you know, metal is a groove. It's a different groove. I really believe that. Definitely. And Gene Hoagland is an amazing metal drummer, so I've been doing a lot of that technique, you know, lately. It's been my world for the last week or so but then of course uh you know joe satriani is in the background there and there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen next year that i can't talk about yet but uh we just finished up the earth tour which was a, a tour that was uh for the uh the elephants of mars album that was uh you know 10 weeks in europe and nine weeks in the states and so there's been a lot it's mostly my world is generally joe satriani and the aristocrats and my solo work uh but Death Clock coming back to life is really great. You know, I weren't sure we would, that that was ever going to happen. And it finally happened. And thank God it's happening at a time yes. when I had a hole in the calendar and I could actually do some of the tour. Yeah, so uh, Yeah, so that's great. But uh, but the other thing is, is yeah, I mean, you know, my last solo album, Scenes from the Flood, which I mentioned before, uh, it took me six years to make that album. And it's a, it's a progressive double concept album. And it is, does deal with some serious topics. And uh, it's it came out in 2019. Uh, which was right before COVID. And, uh, you know, I was going to, I was, I had a plan to do some live shows around that. And of course, COVID kind of just cleared the board, right? You know, and so now, of course, now that the we're reopened, every act is touring at the same time. We all, as professional musicians, we all know, like, everybody's touring. So both Aristocrats and Joe Satriani are going at it hard. Death Clock's back. Everything's back. So it'll be a little while before I can get back and maybe think about a show for that stuff. Uh, but I'm really proud of that album. And Rick, you did amazing work on that oh, album. Thank you. Um, on several yes. songs, several songs, awesome. especially awesome. Angles and Exits. It was really, you know, there's just, if the, which is a cover of a Janet Fetter song, uh, the, you just added these textures and these incredible sound and emotive, just, just so much vibe in that song. I love every it's a, minute it's of a, that. It, it's a ballad. It's kind of a dirge even in a little bit in the end, but uh, it's just so vibey. You yeah. really, he brought, Rick brought the Pink Floyd aspect on that <laughs> so much cool stuff and uh but that's not all he played a lot of cool stuff on the album oh, and so uh you know if you want to check out my stuff you can just go to brianbeller.com which is b-r-y-a-n-b-e-l-l-e-r.com 
And I'm on social media as my own name or Brian Beller Bass on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, The Aristocrats uh, is the-aristocrats-band.com. And of course, we're on social media as well. There's several different aristocrats out there. So, you know, if you see the one with the three long-haired guys, me and, and Guthrie, the white-haired wizard, and Marco, the tall German guy, that's how you know it's us. And uh, uh, like I said, we have a new album coming out soon, and we're going on tour. There's a lot of action going on there. And of course, everybody knows how to find Joe Satriani online. So there you go. What a great band, the Aristocrats. All great, great players. Uh, monster trio. And then you're also playing with some killer players with Satriani. Yeah. Who's in the band again? Uh, right now, the band is uh, Kenny Aronoff on drums and me on bass and Ray Thistlethwaite on keyboards and guitar, who is the keyboard player for Knower, uh, and or one of the keyboard players for Knower. And if you don't have uh, Knower for, was it Knower Forever? Is that the new album? Yeah. 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 You have to get this album. It's so you have great. To, yeah, you have it's to check it out. It's <laughs> so great. Oh my god. So and Ray is amazing. Ray One is of my favorite keyboard players now. Really, I really. And I haven't met him yet. Incredibly talented dude. Yeah. He sings. He plays guitar. He's keyboards. He's not just a muso. He has a pop band, pop rock band in Australia called Thirsty Merc, which is he's like unfairly talented. This guy he can do so many things. So that's the Joe Satriani band now, and uh, Death Clock. Uh, on this tour that's coming up is going to be is of course Brendan Small who invented the whole yes. thing and plays you know lead and everything and Gene Hogan on drums and Neely Brosh is playing guitar the second guitar uh, uh, on this tour so it's going to be really exciting nice. Neely's amazing Neely's also on my album uh, Scenes from the Flood and she's got a bunch of solo stuff and and she's on uh, she does the Danny Elfman live show as well and of course Gene Hogan is a metal legend and he's played with you know Death and Dark Angel and Strapping Young Lad and Testament and just everybody. So, he's awesome. Yeah, he's amazing. So it's that's a cool band as well. Yeah. And by and the Brandon, way, Brandon's, Brandon's awesome. yeah, Brandon, the new album, I'm not on it because I we couldn't figure out a time when I could do it. It was late late last year. I was on the road constantly. And so he just recorded all the bass himself. It sounds amazing. Oh, that's he awesome. He's got such a great <laughs> sound and his ideas are great. And so I just I just heard the Death Album 4 for the first time uh, these last 48 hours. And it is great. It's so good. Yeah. I'm a fan of that, of the Death Clock music, not just in the band. Yeah. So when a new album comes out, I'm excited. And I also, you know? I also like uh, Brendan, as far as Brendan's world, I love uh, the Galacticon stuff. That yeah. Did, you know, yeah. 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 Those songs. We got to play that once live, I think. Who was playing guitar? It was me, uh, Brendan, me, Mike Keneally, uh -huh. and Jude Gold. Yeah, that was the West Fest. Four guitar players. That was a West Fest. Okay. It was. It was. Yeah. I remember. There yeah. were four background singers. <laughs> okay, but we did a full set, didn't we? Yeah, like, yeah. Full set of his stuff. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So I love that stuff. Yeah, no, it's Brennan's genius, and uh, you know, nobody does what he does. He created a whole world, and you know, talk about man, you want you should get him on this thing. Moment you know? of inspiration. Yeah, moment of inspiration. <laughs> I mean, the the story. The, I mean, you hear a story, a moment of inspiration, right? I always tell this story that Brendan, you know, had a television show called Home Movies, which was a, a, a kind of a cult hit, but wasn't like a big breakthrough hit, but it was popular and yeah. very well respected. But after a couple seasons, they didn't renew it. He got that show when he was like in his late 20s, like he was a young, successful guy with a television show, right? Yeah. And then suddenly he didn't have a television show. So he was trying to figure out what to do and he was... He had comedy friends and he had music friends and he had TV friends and you know he was according to him, uh, he was talking to one of them and like trying to figure, ah, I don't know what I'm gonna do now. I've got to come up with an idea for another show and blah 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 blah. And meanwhile, he's like always talking about going to see metal bands because he was a huge metal fan and he was a shredder guitarist and he went to Berkeley and all that. And uh, uh, if I if I recall the story correctly, apparently he was going on and on about it. And one of his friends said to him, you know, you should write a show about metal. It's all you ever talk about. <laughs> That's cool. And he was like three years later, you know, or yeah. however many years later it was, you know, you had this show that just took over the world. He totally did it. So yeah. you never know. Yeah. You know, you never know. Yeah. Moment inspiration uh, triggered by somebody's words. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. But really it's, a, yeah, it was, yeah, triggered by his own experiences, yeah. you yeah. know, but sometimes it takes somebody else yeah, to say right. something. Yeah. 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 Go, oh, see wow, it, okay. see it. yeah, exactly. To see yourself <laughs> through somebody else's eyes. That's so great. It's clear that like, you know, he had all these skills as a comedy writer and as a musician and he loved metal, uh, and he knew how to run a television show, uh, that all these things could be combined yeah. into one monster thing. Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, he's done it. 
And it's super funny. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian, I want to thank you so much for having us here and being a part of uh, our channel. I wish you, you all the best with all the cup upcoming tours and thank travels you, you have. Thank you. And, and more beautiful music to happen. Thank you very much, Ricky. Thanks yes. for having me on. Thank you.